Subcommittee will come to order, and uh, Mr. Secretary, it is fabulous to have you here. We welcome your testimony, uh, and you know, thank you for again appearing before us, uh, Mr. Secretary, and thank you very much for your service to our country, both in uniform and out. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I appreciated our recent uh, phone call about uh, your visit to the FFA's Mike Monroney Aeronautical Center and the Will Rogers uh, Airport in Oklahoma City a few weeks ago. I'm glad you were able to see firsthand some of the critical transportation assets that are in Oklahoma, and I look forward to discussing uh, what more we can do in Oklahoma, given our unique geography, DOT facilities, and opportunities with other federal entities like the Department of Defense. And naturally, uh, I all, I'm even more anxious to see what we can do working together uh, to improve our country's critical and complex transportation system. Uh, the Department of Transportation is requesting $27.9 billion in discretionary budget authority for fiscal year 2024, coupled with the $36.8 billion in advanced appropriations and the nearly $80 billion in the Highway Trust Fund, DOT is seeking $145 billion in total resources. The Infrastructure uh, Investment and Jobs Act uh, included over $184 billion in advanced appropriations over a five-year period. Let me be clear, these appropriations are under the jurisdiction of this committee. We will not be treating these large amounts of taxpayer dollars as if they are on autopilot. The funds will be subject to strong oversight as we consider the fiscal year 2024 appropriations. Mr. Secretary, I know that the department takes safety very seriously. So do I and the members of this committee. Safety will be among our top priorities, if not the top priority, as we carefully consider how to allocate resources. From rail car der uh, derailments to motor vehicle uh, traffic fatalities to airline close calls, there's no shortage of safety concerns. Even as we work to rein in excessive spending, I want to work with my colleagues to provide the appropriate level of support to DOT programs that ensure the safety of our skies, roads, and railroads. This issue uh, has a nationwide impact, whether it's in tribal, rural, or urban areas, uh, and our concerns are common. I also uh, want to work with you, Mr. Secretary, to find ways to meet the unique transportation needs of tribal and rural America. Nearly 70% of America's road miles are in rural areas, and about 145,000 miles of roads pass through tribal lands. These communities face notable challenges and have difficult needs uh, or different needs from uh, urban areas. Additionally, these communities too often do not have the resources they need to compete for funding in competitive discretionary programs at DOT, which were dramatically increased uh, by the IIJA. Uh, we need to make sure that the programs under your leadership effectively serve the taxpaying public. That includes common sense regulatory reform to reduce burdens on state and local and tribal governments. It also means that we need to continue looking at ways to eliminate waste, fraud, and abuse across all programs under the jurisdiction of the subcommittee. I am uh, concerned that the administration's policies have not appropriately addressed inflation and supply chain bottlenecks. While inflation cooled to 5% uh, last month, it remains well above the 2% target. And the high interest rates that the Federal Reserve uh, has implemented to deal with inflation inflict enormous pain on American families and businesses. Uh, excessive government spending is not the right approach to deal with this problem, as these challenges continue to adversely impact our constituents' quality of life. We are eager to hear your testimony today on how you will utilize the resources at the department to foster a safer transportation system, address supply chain challenges, and help tribal and rural communities with their distinct transportation needs. Given the history of bipartisanship of this subcommittee, there are common interests shared by members on both sides of the aisle. As we begin the appropriations process, I look forward to working with my colleagues and with you, Mr. Secretary, to responsibly fund the government. I'd now like to recognize my good friend, the distinguished ranking member from Illinois, Mr. Quigley, for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Secretary, uh, as I'm sure you've learned, our chairman is a good friend and a very thoughtful, hardworking chairman, and uh, we look forward to working with him and yourself on these issues. Uh, you and I have had the pleasure of connecting over the last couple of years in your capacity. You have been a great partner, and I look forward to uh, continuing our work together. Uh, in my role as ranking member. 
Overall, the budget request dedicates more than $108 billion to sustain our transportation networks and protect the safety of our airways, waterways, and railroads. This investment includes hiring 1,800 additional air traffic controllers, nearly $3 billion to expand bus and rapid transit to help everyday Americans travel to work, school, and health appointments, and $4.8 billion to prevent collisions, improve worker safety, and perform signal and tra track upgrades on our rail systems. There was a derailment again in Chicago last night, uh, top of our minds. These investments will ensure that whether it rolls, floats, or flies, our transportation does so safely and efficiently. Now the enactment of the 2022 Bipartisan Infrastructure and Investment Act makes great strides to advance safety and modernization of the nation's modes of transportation. The IIJA included more than $660 billion over five years to accelerate improvements to ports, roads, bridges, airports, and rail lines, making safety, resiliency, and mobility improvements possible in this decade. Funds in IIJA prioritize lengthy and costly capital backlogs that propel the sophistication of America's transportation networks. Due to their size and scale, these projects are not meant to be fully funded through this subcommittee's annual appropriations bill, which is why IIJA was so desperately needed. What the annual spending bill can do is provide the steady investment our nation needs to move beyond a state of good repair for our transit networks and ensure these networks are safe, resilient, and efficient. In essence, it gets us closer to closing the funding gap, leverages other public and private resources, and helps put shovels in the ground. This is a responsibility of our subcommittee that we must meet annually. Every single program dollar must be supported by federal staff. Having the necessary resources, workforce pipeline, and information technology is critical to the success of not only IIJ, but the annual appropriated funding provided by the subcommittee. Revisiting the emergence of these needs each year is critical. Mr. Secretary, what you have put forward builds on the progress we have made in fiscal year 2023. This work takes time, diligence, foresight, and great leadership. While I believe every accident is preventable, you continue to rise to the occasion to ask for and deploy timely resources and reasonable solutions when emergencies and catastrophes arrive. I look forward to working with the Chairman and you, Mr. Secretary, and getting to a budget agreement that does not reverse or harm the progress we have made. I want to ensure that DOT has the support necessary to meet its mission to advance the world's leading transportation system in the most safe, equitable, and sustainable way. We look forward to your testimony, sir. Thank you very much. We have the great privilege of having my good friend and old working partner on uh, Labor H, the ranking member of the full committee, gentlelady from Connecticut, Ms. Dolores, recognized for her opening statement. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And I might just say it's wonderful to be with you on, 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 on the dais. And I, I, it won't be uh, a, a secret to anyone, but I do miss working with you uh, uh, on the committee. But it's a delight to be here with you and with uh, our, our Ranking Member Quigley this morning. Uh, I, and Mr. Secretary, thank you for being with us uh, today. You know, I, I, you, you, you know this, and we all know this on this committee, that our transportation infrastructure is central to the health and well-being of all of our communities. It connects everyone in urban, suburban, rural areas to their jobs, schools, grocery stores, and the care that they depend on. And the work that your department and this subcommittee do ensures every American has access to reliable, safe, and efficient transportation. Uh, as you will testify, and I quote, our transportation system is at a turning point. Because together with Congress over the past two years, you have done so much to repair our transportation infrastructure, but progress must continue. In the 2023 government funding package, this committee made robust investments in the safety and the durability of our transportation. We invested in airports, highways, transit, passenger rail, and port systems. We included $3.6 billion to ensure safe air travel and for vehicle and highway safety programs. We cut emissions improve resiliency and, and address inequities while creating and sustaining tens of thousands of jobs. We fought the climate crisis and generated economic opportunities for working and middle class families. And we made strong investments in our districts through community projects. We included an overwhelming majority of requests from Democrats and Republicans through the Department of Transportation 
total of 773 projects. These projects meet the urgent needs of so many of our constituents. To build on this success, the President's request for DOT includes $27.8 billion in discretionary funding to create a safer, more equitable, and a more modern transportation system. If I can just touch on just a few of the programs important to my community in Connecticut, to make our rail infrastructure safer, more efficient, the request increases funding for Amtrak's Northeast Corridor, including the Hudson Tunnels to meet the needs of our nation's busiest and most complex rail corridor. And you increase funding through the Consolidated Rail Infrastructure and Safety Improvements, Chrissy, uh, program to make significant advancements to the safety of our rail uh, network. You also plan to make important investments to uh, address the roadway safety crisis including the critical funding that would accelerate the development. And this is an area I've, I've written to you about of the use of female uh, dummies in crash testing. This will start to fight the gender inequity among vehicle safety and crash victims. This budget also builds upon and helps actualize the critical investments uh, in the president's historic bipartisan infrastructure law. Before I conclude, um, I would just like to mention my worry over some, only some, of my Republican colleagues' calls for drastic cuts to government funding. Yesterday, Speaker McCarthy introduced a bill to cut funding back to the 2022 levels and to impose caps for the next 10 years. Please, let's not make a mistake. Caps are just more cuts. And as you mentioned in your letter to me on the impact of these cuts, they would set our progress back significantly let me read some of them to you. Following the ca catastrophic derailments in eastern Ohio and West Virginia, rail safety jobs would be dramatically reduced with 11,000 fewer safety inspection days and 30,000 fewer miles of track which is inspected annually. After recent near misses, our air travel would come to a halt with 125 air traffic control towers shutting down, impacting one third of all U.S. airports. The cuts are devastating. The safety of our communities and our transportation infrastructure depends on strong investments, which in a bipartisan way, we have been able to do in the last two years, in 2022 and in 2023. We should continue to move in that direction. I thank you again, Mr. Secretary, for all of your work. And with that, Chairman Cole and Ranking Member Quigley, I yield back. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Mr. Secretary, again, it's a delight to have you here, and you're recognized for your opening testimony. Well, good morning, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairman Cole, Ranking Member Quigley, Ranking Member DeLauro, uh, of the full committee, and all of the members of the subcommittee for welcoming us here and for the opportunity to discuss President Biden's budget request for the Department of Transportation seeking resources totaling $145 billion. I want to thank the members on both sides of the aisle who have been true partners as we work together to build a better, stronger, safer transportation system for the American people. Your leadership has helped to make the 2020s into an infrastructure decade for our country. We're in a moment of both profound challenge and historic opportunity for U.S. transportation. On one hand, our transportation systems are still grappling with the consequences of the pandemic, climate change, and decades of disinvestment. Industries have become more concentrated, often slashing staff and leaving the system less competitive. And when something goes wrong, Americans bear the burden, from millions of airline passengers stranded during the holidays to the residents of East Palestine, Ohio, after the Norfolk Southern train derailment there. Yet this is also a moment of unrivaled opportunity and progress. Thanks to the President's leadership and the work of this Congress, we have unprecedented resources to modernize our infrastructure. Every week, shuttle, shovels are hitting the ground across our country. To date, we've announced over $200 billion for over 23,000 infrastructure projects, and we're continuing to get funding to communities as swiftly as we responsibly can. To name just a few examples from the transportation dimension of that investment. Already, we've started repairing 4,600 bridges and improving almost 70,000 miles of roads, which will mean lower costs, fewer delays, and safer trips. We've awarded the first round of grants under our Safe Roads and Streets for All program, 
delivering safety funding to big cities like Detroit, rural communities like Fayette County, Iowa, and tribal lands like the Blackfeet Indian Reservation in Montana. As you know, we see roughly as many traffic deaths in America as gun deaths every year. That's why the president's budget includes $3.1 billion for the Highway Safety Improvement Program and Advanced Safety Research Initiatives. We have also advanced public transit projects across the country. This budget includes $4.45 billion for our popular capital investment grants, which have supported major initiatives like the two light rail extensions in Phoenix and the Red Line extension in Chicago. And the budget would give transit agencies the flexibility they need to use federal formula funding for operating expenses as they adapt to new post-pandemic ridership patterns. We've strengthened ports around the country, from smaller ones like Helena, Arkansas, and Kaskaskia, Illinois, to major ones in Portsmouth, Virginia, and New York City. Our work on supply chains has helped to cut the number of ships idling at U.S. ports from over 100 down to the single digits. And the president's budget includes $230 million for the Port Infrastructure Development Program to continue this important work. For rail, we've made 18, nearly $18 billion available to improve service and safety, to advance more than 70 major projects, and proposed a new rule that would require a minimum of two crew members per train. Derailments are down compared to decades past, but it is unacceptable that we still see roughly three per day in the United States. That's why the president's budget includes $273 million to support FRA safety personnel and expand our inspection capabilities. I've been heartened by the recent surge of bipartisan support for rail safety, and we are eager to work with anyone who is serious about this subject. It's why we strongly support the Railway Safety Act and hope that all of those leaders who have spoken out on this issue will join us in supporting that work. Aside from funding good projects, we're also using our regulatory authorities to protect the traveling public. In aviation, we're getting airlines to honor the tickets they sell and compensate passengers fairly when there are issues. The cancellation rate has stayed well below 2% so far this year compared to over 5% in January 2022, but there's still much more work to do. It's part of why the president's budget includes $24.8 billion, which will help to hire new air traffic controllers, improve airports, and modernize critical systems. In short, there's a great deal of work underway and a great deal yet to be done. Our transportation system is at a turning point. We're finally in the process of renewing its physical foundations, but we're also grappling with serious vulnerabilities that pose real danger to workers, families, and communities. In 2021, Congress demonstrated that it could deliver the transformative bipartisan infrastructure law that had evaded our predecessors for decades. Now we need to bring that same ded dedication to sustain those investments in America and ensure that they reach every person and every community. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here again, and I look forward to your questions. Pretty impressive, Mr. Secretary. It's right on the button. <laughs> so thank you on time. We strive for uh, on time Before we go into questions, let me quickly uh, do some housekeeping. As I'm sure the Secretary's aware, and I know the members are, we are we're in the midst of votes right now. We're going to try and operate the uh, hearing continuously. So you come and go as you need to, but we want to be respectful of the Secretary's time. And uh, I don't want us to have to adjourn and then come back and stay longer. And I know a lot of you, of course, have... Uh, lights to catch on the final day of the week. So again, we're just going to move along as best we can. You decide when you come and go and what you need to do. And let's accommodate the secretary so we can get out here on time as well. Uh, Mr. Secretary, let me begin. And uh, uh, you know, one of the things that all appropriators, regardless of uh, <clears throat> party and, uh, and any other opinions they have, hate are continuing resolutions. Uh, because it essentially sidelines us from doing our job and allocating resources, making adjustments, uh, you know, doing the things we need to do to, to deliver for the American people. I know this causes a lot of problems for you as well. So I'd like you just to educate uh, the committee as to what the consequences of a continuing resolution would be for the Department of Transportation. Well, thank you for uh, the question. We, we certainly share that, uh, that bipartisan view. A, a, a full year continuing resolution would have a number of negative impacts on our department's ability to do our work. I'll, I'll highlight a few. Uh, one, uh, no additional funding to support increased air traffic control hiring, something that we have proposed in the 24 budget, uh, which is important in order to have the right level of certified controllers and prevent staffing issues from contributing to delays. 
there could be delays in modernizing essential technology infrastructure supporting the national aviation system, including uh, systems like the uh, NODEM system that caused trouble earlier this year. Uh, over $1.7 billion in authorized surface transportation grant funding uh, supporting infrastructure projects and safety initiatives would not be available to the states because the obligation limitation would be held to those fiscal 23 levels. And we would see, uh, of course, increased pressure on our operational and administrative funding across the board because we have those inflationary issues and pay increases that go with them. So uh, certainly something that would cause a lot of concern and uh, would frustrate us in our mission. Thank you very much. Uh, as you know, many of the large discretionary grant programs through the Department of Transportation are required to submit a benefit cost analysis, or BCA, uh, in their grant applications. BCA can be a valuable resource for the department when evaluating the benefits and costs associated with constructing uh, an infrastructure project. However, I've heard uh, the BCA calculations disproportionately affects tribal and rural projects, uh, and they're having difficulty meeting the thresholds. From my understanding, uh, if an applicant has a benefit ratio cost of less than one, the department will not consider the project. Mr. Secretary, are you aware of any concerns from stakeholders or grant applicants about the BCA guidance and its calculations, particularly from tribal and rural areas? Well, it's very important to us to make sure that the uh, uh, BCA process is one that doesn't unfairly disadvantage any community. And uh, uh, where uh, Congress requires that uh, there be uh, a benefit cost ratio in excess of one, uh, it's important to us to make sure that that process is one uh, that is fair and, uh, and workable for project sponsors. I will say that uh, in some ways this can be beneficial for rural and tribal communities. Uh, often costs are lower in those areas compared to urban areas around issues like right-of-way acquisition. And often uh, uh, transportation system users in, in rural or tribal areas lack existing alternatives, which means the benefits loom large too. But, but I'm very conscious of the ways in which there can be uh, uh, unintended consequences of the way that uh, BCA computations are done, and we're frequently revisiting them to make sure both the process and the substance of it puts no one at an unfair disadvantage. Well, we'd like to work with you on that. Uh, I can tell you I've certainly had uh, uh, concerns expressed from my Department of Transportation in Oklahoma, which, of course, is a rural state, uh, that they're, they're having a, a very difficult time with it. And I hear the same thing from tribal governments, and as you know, as well as I, the resources they have for these kinds of studies vary enormously depending on the size, sophistication, relative wealth of the tribe. So a lot of the smaller, more remote ones who actually have the greatest infrastructure needs are really disadvantaged in this situation and are frankly looking to us and this committee and honestly the department as well to figure out ways to put them in a position to be able to compete more effectively for this, these funds. Well, we, we would welcome an opportunity to work with you on that. We want to make sure that this process is, of course, rigorous, but also user-friendly. And the smaller the community or the less resources it has, the more daunting that process can be. Uh, we want to do everything we can to, uh, uh, to make sure that it's not a barrier to these communities accessing the funds. Do you have specific proposals that you have in this area right now that you're considering? Well, one thing I know is that uh, OMB has uh, uh, revised guidance on the BCA process. What we try to do is fit the, any either administrative guidance, uh, administration-wise, uh, administration-wide, excuse me, and or uh, uh, statutorily required uh, thresholds and fit them to a day-to-day -day process that's more user-friendly. It's part of why we stepped up technical assistance, try to make sure that our own resources go to working with those communities uh, that can struggle. Uh, and there, there are a handful of processes that aren't subject, or I should say programs that aren't subject to that uh, BCA requirement. And so when we see one that uh, just any way you do it isn't going to make the cut, but is still a worthy project, uh, we try to remind project sponsors of the opportunity to apply to those programs as well. Thank you very much. Uh, now I'll turn to, oh, uh, the ranking member of the full, you want to go to vote? No, no, I said I'll, I'll go next. Okay, yeah, very good. The ranking member of the full committee, my good friend, Ms. Delore, for her questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. In, in the interest of time, mm -hmm. the votes, let me just... Uh, 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 truncate any kind of commentary, but focus in, uh, Mr. Secretary, on what has been uh, the pronouncements on uh, 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 cutting uh, the uh, budgets of uh, this uh, to at least uh, uh, 22 percent if we move to the 2022 levels for the 2024 budget. With regard to Amtrak, um, that would mean a $540 million cut to Am Amtrak. What would be the real-life impact uh, it, it for Amtrak to sustain this, uh, the, the, sc the scale of a cut. I mean, do the other two. Uh, w 
how does the president's request uh, support Amtrak? How can the Consolidated Rail Infrastructure and Safety Improvements, the CRISI program, and the Federal-State Partnership uh, for Intercity Passenger Rail Grants program provide funding to provide critical lines uh, for the Northeast Corridor and sustain uh, to sustain and improve performance? Um, let me also add one more to that, which is um, uh, really alarming about the potential to FAA and the, the nation's air traffic controllers if we move uh, to these uh, to these areas. So those uh, are three. I, I will also make an addendum. Heritage Foundation, which a number of my colleagues are, are you know, support a very prestigious think tank, has talked about eliminating the rebuilding of American infrastructure with sustainability and equity, the RAISE program, federal state partnership and inner city uh, rail grants, uh, capital investment grants, and phasing out the grants to the National Rail Passenger Service Corporation. So these cuts uh, are the potential, these cuts is real. It's not just speculation. So if you could just answer these uh, the questions. Well, eliminating a program like RAISE would mean that hundreds of communities would miss out on the opportunity to make improvements that are benefiting everything from uh, uh, supply chains to physical safety of travelers. And uh, I could point to every part of the country where those projects are underway. Uh, we get dramatically more, even at the robust funding levels we have, uh, we get dramatically more demand than we can meet. And so we know that communities have a need. Uh, it would be uh, a terrible loss, I think, to, to not have the opportunity to help meet that need. With regard to Amtrak, uh, the, the budget requests $3.1 billion, and that's to fund base operating capital and debt service requirements. This would be on, in addition to the advanced appropriations. Uh, without them, I have to think that that would have a, a, an impact both in terms of delaying Amtrak's progress in dealing with their maintenance backlog uh, and issues that, that uh, uh, folks, whether they are traveling intercity or whether Amtrak is part of their daily commute, as it famously was for, for the president for, for many years, uh, would, would see that, feel that, and, and, and face the cost and the burden of that. Uh, you mentioned CRISI grants. Uh, the, uh, the S in, uh, in that acronym, CRISI, is for safety. safety. And at a moment when mm -hmm. the country is rightly focused on the safety of our railroad systems, uh, to, uh, uh, to put it concisely, mm -hmm. this is the wrong time to be cutting back on railroad safety. And that's important uh, whether we're talking about CRISI as a program or whether we're talking about the effects that the uh, proposed cuts would have on the ability of the Federal Rail Administration to conduct the inspections that are such an important part of how they keep our railroads safe. Uh, likewise, on the aviation side, uh, with everything that the aviation sector can uh, has been through, uh, I cannot imagine uh, why anybody would believe that now is a good time to be shutting down air traffic control towers. We depend on these facilities and the workers in them to make sure that uh, uh, that our national aviation, aviation system is safe. And while uh, the FAA would not allow any unsafe condition to arise, regardless of, uh, of budget uh, uh, constraints, what would certainly happen uh, is an effect on uh, uh, the uh, uh, cancellations and delays that sometimes happen when you don't have uh, adequate uh, staffing or resources to serve them. I appreciate the, the commentary, Mr. Secretary, and I would just say I, I think sometimes it's often um, easy to say we are going to uh, cut 22 percent. It's about when you put pen to paper and you look at what the implications are as you laid out. I think there's a very big education process here in a very short period of time. I think because I do believe that, uh, particularly on this committee, on a bipartisan basis, people understand the direction that we're trying to go in. You talk about a historic moment, and we're at a turning point, and we have made serious, serious investments. This is about safety. It's about jobs. It's about our economic future. Uh, and that's what transportation is. And so that, I, but I think with the understanding of what the, the, the devastation of what we would inflict on our economy and on the public and in their public's best interest, I would work with you to help get that information out and to talk through how we may be able to really encourage people to say, we can't go down this road. Let's think about how we can deal with spending, but let's not, you know, move in that direction. So thank you very, very much. Um, uh, for all your efforts and your commitment to, uh, uh, to the job. So thank you. Thanks very much. I'm likely not to come back, you know, after both Understood. because there's others. So, so I appreciate being here with you this morning. Thank you.
Well, Mr. Secretary, uh, welcome. And uh, first of all, I want to thank you for your service. As a former secretary, I understand how difficult your task is, and I appreciate your service. I also understand the responsibility you bear, uh, being responsible for a transportation system and a secure supply chain. I'm sure we both agree that, that I would say it is in our best interest in national security to have a supply chain uh, that is controlled by U.S. or our allies. And I also, also would uh, well, ask you to agree that energy independence certainly would be a priority in our national security. Indeed. Well, given that, uh, you also have a record of being an advocate for climate change. I don't think that's changed. Would you, would you, is that I wouldn't say assessment? I'm for climate change. I'm for fighting it, certainly, yes. Sure. So uh, are you aware then that China is the largest emitter of CO2? Yes. And are you aware that China is responsible for 90% of the plastics? 90% of the plastics in the oceans come from four rivers in China. Are you aware of that? I didn't know that statistic, but I'm not surprised by it. Well, are you aware also that China is the largest violator of fishing regulations and laws? Yes. And, of course, you're also aware of critical minerals. Yes. Are you aware that China controls, either directly or indirectly, more than 62 percent, in many cases, the preponderance or absolute control of critical minerals? A condition we are working hard to change in this administration. And I'm going to ask you further about that. But critical minerals, as you know, is also required for EV. Indeed. Seems to be that cobalt, lithium, in some cases germanium, mm -hmm. is absolutely required for, for EV. And are you aware that, that to meet the demands today, that the U.S. would have to increase mining by 2,000 percent for 20 years to reach the demands today? Well, the chemistry of our batteries has not completely stabilized in a way that I think can be fully predict, uh, predicted for the next There, uh, there decade, may be but there's no question that we're going to... Right now. Yeah, there, there's no question that we're no, going to need to no, source no more uh, minerals, both domestically and from friendly countries. Well, and, and, and that's, that's the catch, mm. is uh, we all want cleaner, better, more efficient. But your stated goal and Biden's stated, President Biden's stated goal and my stated goal and, and certainly President Trump's was the same, is that we seek energy independence. Mm. We seek energy dominance so we're not held hostage by foreign entities. Indeed. Well, how do you get to be energy independent mm. when the components of EV today are all controlled by China? And have you done an assessment of how much mining we would have to do and where the critical minerals are and what we'd have to do in order to meet the demands of, the, of a very aggressive program to convert. And have you, you done an assessment? Yes, thanks for, uh, thanks for the question. While some of the finer points related to extraction are probably better answered by my colleagues at the Department of the Interior, our Joint Office of Energy and Transportation, which is jointly run by both uh, uh, us and the and, Department And what does the Energy assessment has, say since, since you've completed it? Well, uh, w what that work is doing is identifying different points, not just in the raw material extraction itself, but also in the refining, uh, where we see that if we were to... But you, have you identified where our, where our sticking points is? Uh, or where right, so a lot how, of the... How yeah. to get there in 10 years? Because it seems like on, on the supply chain, mm -hmm. if China controls it today, mm -hmm. and we're putting moratorium on mines in Minnesota that have the largest nickel deposit and critical minerals, mm -hmm. and we're not moving forward, on securing the supply chain, but we're moving forward on, on solar cells. Well, again, the uh, Department and of Solar Energy cells made in, made in China. So be much easier to answer So how are you going to figure this out? Okay. Uh, so part of what uh, you're describing is the motivation behind the investments that the Department of Energy has been leading in enhancing U.S. So, well, I, I agree. There, there's effort, but have you identified source? Because there's a difference between practical, real, and fiction. Well, so I know they're going to be in, independent if China produces the very components that make up EV. Well, this is exactly why we're doing the work to produce them here in the United States. I and wish. What, you what are we? What are we doing on on cobalt? How much cobalt are we producing in this country? In the next ten years, what do we need? And where? And how are we going? I'm a military guy. I love plans. Great. You know I do. Well, first of all, I'd encourage you to become familiar with the private investment and the public-private partnership investment, real dollars, not just plans, uh, that are going out through these DOE Have you programs. read the Critical Mineral Report, the multi-agency report, 2017? 
I have not read the 2017 multi-agency critical mineral report. I am very familiar. I'm sure you are. Absolutely familiar. Have you read the 2017 climate, recha- climate change report multi-agency? Uh, I believe that's informed some of the work that uh, is in our plans it? through the joint uh, energy, but I've not uh, read that document cover to cover now. I, 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 w- I would suggest that, Mr. Secretary, that you read those two documents. Well, I can on both cases mm-hmm. what they what they clearly state is the U.S. is becoming dependent on China, which is and in, unless we change the rudder, mm-hmm. is that we will be more dependent. And unless we figure out the supply chain first, our pursuit of EV makes us more dependent on China. I would argue that our action to win the EV future cannot wait. I would argue that China is already working to win EVs and that so they how, will win well, if Mr. we do Mr. Secretary, not if it requires critical minerals and we don't have control of them, and China manufactures, produces, processes the very components necessary for EV, then how is that achievable to be independent if we depend on China more? And the more we press, and I'll, I'm all for the above, all the above, but before we leap blindly, there's two concerns. Mm-hmm. One is that we have clear control, either ourselves or our allies, of the supply chain mm-hmm. to include the critical minerals and components. Secondly is what are we going to do when they're end of lifestyle, of life cycle? As you know, 90% or are you aware that 90% of the solar cells today are dumped in some landfill across the country? Not as familiar with the life cycle of solar cells, but I would emphasize one of the most important things to bear in mind when we think about the critical mineral sourcing and refining that goes into EV battery components is that end-of-life recycling will be a vital part uh, of how we meet our marks. Now, of course, uh, that's alongside the onshoring and friendshoring that we need to do, both with regard and to and the extraction. Unfortunately, we're going to take a recess, um, but, okay. but the concerns, uh, I know with this, is the concerns I have or supply chain from the very beginning to the very end. What are we going to do, and and does that make us more vulnerable to a potential adversary? Mm -hmm. So with that, since there's only one member in promotion by attrition, (laughs) we'll have to take a quick recess. And, uh, and sir, thank you for for, for being here, and I I appreciate all you do. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, The uh, committee is reconvened. Mr. Secretary, again, thank you for your indulgence and your patience as uh, we work through uh, getting members to the floor. Sorry we couldn't keep it going as continuously as we hoped we would, but uh, at least we limited the disruption. If I can, now we'll uh, go to my good friend, the ranking member, for any questions he cares to offer. Thank you again, Chair. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, the, the chairman asked uh, about what happens if we have a CR and what impact that has. Uh, My friend, the ranking member of the full committee, talked about what those cuts might mean uh, if we're at 20% to particularly rail safety. I guess what's left is if we're at 20%, what does that do to uh, how you prioritize system safety beyond just rail and what it means to transportation as a whole? Uh, we're a safety agency, and uh, everything we do is, is prioritized uh, first and foremost around safety. And that also means that when our activities are cut or suspended or uh, impacted uh, by some of these issues, uh, that affects our ability to meet our safety mission. Uh, if we think about the aviation side of that, for example, we'd be looking at a hiring freeze, in effect, for our whole operations and facilities workforce. That includes controllers, includes safety inspectors. uh, And uh, uh, there's some experience of this in in the past from uh, uh, moments like the 2013 sequester. That was just a 5% reduction and uh, led to furloughs, which, uh, of course, are going to have an impact. Uh, If we were, uh, you know, we talked about about rail, uh, I would point to our uh, Pipeline Hazardous Material Safety Administration, PHMSA. Uh, I don't see how they could uh, conduct the current pace of field inspections with those kinds of cuts. In fact, we estimate about 2,000 fewer days uh, would be dedicated to inspecting hazardous liquid and natural gas pipeline facilities and LNG export facilities, as well as a 
diminished ability to respond to hazmat incidents, which they often do. For example, uh, while it, I think it's widely known that Federal Rail Administration personnel were on the ground within hours in East Palestine, uh, I'm not sure everyone is aware that uh, FIMSA personnel were there too. These are the kinds of activities that could be impacted. Uh, there would be a, a reduced workforce and hiring freeze at, at NHTSA, which of course makes sure that our vehicles are safe. Uh, transit would be affected. There's no part of our transportation system or our safety mission that I don't think I don't think we'd be touched in some way by these levels of cuts. Delve a little deeper on uh, FEMSA and just what resources are necessary, and for, forget the issue of cuts. You know, in a perfect world. What is it that we need? What numbers do we need to get to enhance rail safety to the point where it's never going to be foolproof, but uh, we can uh, can help overcome the numbers that we're facing now? Mm. Well, for FIMSA, we're, we're requesting uh, 387.3 million and 690 positions, uh, and uh, that is uh, spread across pipeline safety hazardous material safety, emergency preparedness grants, and that's another area I would say comes into play often when you have incidents like what happened in East Palestine because we uh, found that many of the first responders who were involved in that response had been trained thanks to uh, federally funded FIMSA programming. And then, of course, you have the uh, FRA side of the house, uh, which uh, is seeking funding that would uh, allow FRA to continue to uh, uh, expand and, and develop its safety programs. Since arriving, this administration established a, a process of doing uh, detailed safety audits on individual railroads to check for compliance issues. And uh, that kind of proactive work is something we would love to be able to do more uh, of, even within the authorities we have. Uh, provided we have appropriate staffing, uh, staffing. Then, as I mentioned in my testimony, of course, we're also interested in further authorities that might come by way of the bipartisan dialogue right now about uh, rail safety legislation. And where are rail partners at with this, with what their responsibilities are and what they still need to do? Well, I think they could be doing a lot more, and I've called on them to do a lot more. I will say after I called on them to participate, for example, in the confidential close call reporting system, which uh, enables whistleblowers at railroad companies to identify safety issues without fear of reprisal. Uh, they did respond, and all seven of the Class One railroads committed to, uh, to join that program. So that's a step that I do want to recognize. Uh, but we would like to see a lot more. Uh, for example, more proactive work to notify communities when hazardous materials are coming into their jurisdictions aboard uh, freight trains. And uh, while we will continue calling on industry to do the right thing, I think ultimately, rather than merely asking, we need to make sure we have the right combination of legislation and enforcement activity to compel them to do the right thing. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you very much. We'll next go to my good friend from Florida, Representative Rutherford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, great to, great to see you. Um, sir, I'd like, to, I'd like to bring up an issue that's um, very near and dear to many people around the country. Uh, these front-over accidents, I've, I've heard from concerned constituents uh, in, in my district and I'm sure every district across America. Uh, these front-overs are usually accidents that occur at a very low speed, usually in parking lots, driveways, and they always involve pedestrians. Uh, it's my understanding that uh, NHTSA reports on non-traffic accidents such as these that occur in driveways, parking lots, or private roads. In their, in their non-traffic report from 2016 to 2020, they noted that 386 pedestrians are killed every year uh, by a forward-moving vehicle in a non-traffic setting. And that's concerning. I, I know there's some efforts out there that the uh, vehicle manufacturers can take. Is the Department of Transportation working with the auto industry at all on technology that could reduce the occurrence of these front overs? Uh, and would DOT benefit from collecting additional information on this uh, from these non-traffic accidents, uh, such as their setting and what causes them? Mm -hmm. You know, you see some of these uh, new trucks, they set so high small child sitting in front of that vehicle, they get in from the back, uh, the driver gets in from the back, doesn't see the child, runs right over them. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, and, and thanks for the chance to address this, this safety concern. Uh, it's something that uh, is mounting, especially as uh, the typical uh, 
privately owned vehicle gets larger across America. Uh, we need to make sure that each passing year our vehicles are safer than they used to be. Uh, I would uh, point to two lines of effort that I think are, are responsive to, uh, to, to the concern you're raising. Uh, one has to do with continued data research and uh, rulemaking on technologies like uh, automatic uh, AEB uh, uh, and the braking that, that goes with that, uh, and uh, just the visibility that can be created through sensors, cameras, and other technology. Mm -hmm. Often they first arrive in the fleet as relatively new and sometimes even untested uh, technology, but uh, quickly can be demonstrated to be something that's uh, got such life-saving potential that it ought to be made a requirement so that whether you have access to it doesn't depend on whether you can afford uh, that, that uh, uh, particular bell or whistle because it's standard. Uh, the second thing I would point to is a shift in how we're thinking about the new car assessment program. Like, uh, traditionally, uh, it was confined to the safety of the occupants. And of course, we're very concerned about the safety of the occupants of a vehicle. Right. That's why seatbelts, airbags, and a whole lot more is evaluated. We've reached the point where we also need to be paying attention to how the design of a vehicle has implications for the safety of those who are outside of it. And that's something that you will see uh, more of, I think, in the years to come okay. as NHTSA develops its uh, uh, next uh, steps for the NCAP program. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'll be interested in following that. Uh, having, having worked the backups before we had the backup cameras, we remember mm -hmm. that? Um, so, uh, it, it, I, I want to bring up the issue of Buy America. Mm. Uh, I'm hearing from many of my constituents back home, if, if they're applying for the grants, uh, the infrastructure grants from the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, uh, the challenge that they have, look, everybody wants to spend our hard-earned tax dollars uh, and their money on uh, American-made. But some of these regulations, uh, I understand that there's lack of clarity surrounding the implementation of the Buy America requirements, causing a lot of confusion among state departments of transportation, local governments, and contractors. Um, I've also heard uh, that these new expanded Buy America standards could actually stall our infrastructure development. Uh, because a lot of the materials that we need, like aggregates, concrete, asphalt, uh, can't meet, the, the American uh, resources can't meet that, those requirements. Um, what is DOT doing to provide information to the various stakeholders, first of all? And just as important, can you assure the subcommittee that the implementation of the Buy America requirements will be done in a way that does not increase project cost and on top of the inflation-related costs that we're already seeing, it does not result in these projects being delayed because you know how, how quickly we need to get them to, right. to fruition. So we're very focused on making sure that uh, these projects are delivered on time and, and, and affordably and recognize that there's a balance between our uh, strong commitment that begins with the president to make sure that American taxpayer dollars buy American goods and American materials uh, and making this a process that our uh, our, our project sponsors find manageable. And in some cases, there will be growing pains as well because we're seeking to stimulate more of a domestic industry, but it's not fully there yet. Uh, our, our intention is to be as transparent and clear as possible about this guidance. Uh, so my hope is that the uh, uh, new uh, Q&A information that Federal Highways put out a few weeks ago, uh, as well as a, uh, 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 the, a further push on communication, will, will be responsive to some of the concerns that you're mentioning. Uh, but this is certainly something we hear about as we talk with state DOTs. And uh, without watering down our commitment to Buy America, we do want to make sure that this is as uh, user-friendly a process as we can make it for our project sponsors and, uh, and that there's a common sense factor applied as well. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I see my time is up. I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, I recognize my good friend from California, Mr. Agrilaw, for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good to see you again, Mr. Secretary. Uh, you've consistently highlighted the need to combat transportation-related emissions, including those related to transit and buses. Uh, this is demonstrated in the President's budget request, which includes $1.1 billion for low- and no-emission vehicle programs to help transit agencies modernize their fleets. Uh, reducing transportation-related emissions is important for, for my district right next door to, to my colleague here, uh, Ms. Torres, uh, as you visited us uh, in the past. Uh, we have some of the worst uh, air pollution in the, in the nation, and um, uh, we want to see this uh, significantly changed, and we know that low and no emission uh, programs is an important part of that. 
Mr. Secretary, how would, first of all, just I guess from a broader perspective, how would uh, the funding levels, uh, if we were to reduce uh, this program to FY22 levels in the low and no emission program, impact underserved communities like ours that continue to suffer from air pollution? Well, we know that an investment in uh, low and no emissions buses is an investment in uh, economic empowerment for the people who ride it, clean air for the people who live around those routes, uh, and, uh, of course, uh, an investment toward our, our national climate goals. Uh, I'll follow up to get the numbers on uh, the, the, the impact uh, that, that would come with that. What I can tell you is that uh, we would be well short of uh, what we're asking for here. There are advance appropriations that are part of the picture for yeah. uh, for the low-no program, but uh, our total request is $1.1 billion. And I can tell you that every penny of that is going to be uh, sought after uh, by project sponsors based on the uh, experience that we had in our first round. We got 530 eligible project applications in fiscal 22 for $7.7 .7 billion uh, worth of, uh, of purchases we were able to fund uh, 1.5 of that. Uh, so we, we know that there is uh, uh, enormous uh, uh, interest here in demand. Uh, and uh, any cut to that would just mean we would have to turn away that many more worthy, worthy and eligible applicants. I also wanted to highlight that uh, San Bernardino County, where I live, has is is experienced positive impacts from this program. Our local transit agency has been working toward a goal of 100% zero emission fleet by 2040. Uh, and in August received $9 million in funding from uh, the low and no emission vehicle program in order to buy four hydrogen fuel cells to add to its fleet, as well as partnering with apprenticeship programs at the local community college to make sure that we can maintain that. I, I think it's a worthy endeavor and uh, they're making significant progress. Um, also wanted to stay uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, the West and talk climate in California. Um, we know over the last several years, California's experienced extreme weather conditions and most recently atmospheric uh, storms and flooding. Uh, the administration's highlighted the growth in extreme uh, weather and climate-related disasters um, from the perspective of uh, having more resilient uh, transportation infrastructure. Can you talk about the work that your, your agency is doing, uh, the department is doing in taking advance uh, construction of more resilient transportation projects? Thank you for the question. We're, we're within a few days of uh, announcing the notice of funding opportunity for the PROTECT problem, uh, program, which is one of the, uh, I think, most novel and timely uh, programs included in the uh, IIJA. Uh, it allows us to fund and support uh, projects that seek to make infrastructure more resilient because, uh, as you noted, these extreme weather events are becoming more frequent and more severe. And from wildfires to droughts to floods to mudslides, they are impacting our infrastructure, uh, certainly in California and every part of the country. Uh, this is also something, of course, it's not just confined to our PROTECT pro uh, program, but it's the first of its kind in terms of being dedicated for that. Uh, we also make sure that uh, where appropriate statutorily, we're integrating resilience considerations as we evaluate various applications that come in. Just to give one example, uh, uh, sometimes a road project will uh, be able to demonstrate that it's of particular significance as an evacuation route. Uh, and that's something that uh, that we would want to take account of. Thank you so much, Mr. Secretary. And uh, on, on behalf of our region, and um, also want to thank you for the uh, grant opportunities that uh, you've sent our way. We very much appreciate it. Uh, we work uh, as, a, as a region in Southern California. We often say that you know, my constituents might work in Norma Torres' district and go to church in another district. Um, so. Uh, Folks, uh, the, the work that the transit agencies do uh, and that we have from a mobility perspective is so important in making sure that people can get to where they need to be. Uh, thank you for your efforts and, and your leadership, and good to see you again. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. We'll go to another of my great friends from California, Mr. Valadeo, for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for making the time for us today. I really appreciate your time. Um, the Central Valley is one of the highest producing agriculture regions in the world, yet due to ongoing supply chain issues, particularly at California's ports, our farmers and ranchers are struggling to get their products to foreign markets. While it's gotten a little bit better, it still continues to be a problem for us. Can you give us any update on what the DOT is doing to make these problems a little bit easier for us? And uh, can you tell me about the coordination between the Department of Transportation and USDA as it relates to ag products facing those delays? Is there any prioritization for perishable goods? 
Well, thank you for the question. And the short answer is yes, we're working closely with USDA. Uh, I would note, for example, that uh, during the most acute periods of these backups, uh, we were able to team up with them on uh, uh, helping make uh, these what are called pop-up uh, ports or container yards available that facilitated a more fluid movement for agricultural exports. And we recognize that while most of the supply chain stories are covered in the media in terms of uh, uh, electronics coming in from Asia, uh, the issue of American goods being exported is a, a very important dimension of this. Uh, it's one of the reasons why we're investing so much in port infrastructure generally, and the uh, president's uh, budget includes a robust request uh, on top of the advanced appropriations for PIDP. Uh, and I, I know that many of the applications that come in for that program would benefit uh, the, the agricultural export fluidity in the long run. In the shorter run, uh, I also appreciate the chance to mention a program of ours called FLOW, Freight Logistics Optimization Works. Uh, this is a voluntary program where we brought in a number of uh, players from across the sector, uh, retailers, ports, uh, uh, anybody who we think has data that if they were just talking to each other more, it would make our ports more efficient and our supply chains more fluid. Uh, and we signed up a number of partners, including largely from the private sector, dozens now, uh, and are working toward being able to have a prototype of that model uh, up and running uh, this year. It'll be a small dollar amount compared to most of our uh, requests, but uh, I think a, an investment well spent for exactly the reasons you're raising. All right. And one of the issues there because of the port situation also can uh, cause some problems with our rail as well. Mm. And um, is the DOT doing anything to help with the rail situation? I mean, obviously we saw all the news with mm. uh, folks with trains literally parked and people stealing all the items off of them. Um, has there been anything on that front? And then on top of that, with the rail issue, I mean, we got to the point where we had farmers literally waiting on commodities moving across the country. Mm. Um, I've got a large ag district with a lot of animal agriculture, so chicken, poultry, pork, dairy, beef, um, waiting on corn, soy, and all the different products that come from the Midwest. And I had truckers running from mill to mill all across the valley, scrambling to get in line to pick up whatever commodity they can find. Um, and it wasn't a simple call. It was you had to show up with a truck, and you've got empty trucks running back and forth, tearing up roads for no purpose just because we weren't able to get those products delivered. And so this rail situation tied with the port just made life miserable for us. And it's gotten a little bit better, but what can we do more? Yeah, we've been pressing the railroad industry on this, but I believe there's also a public sector role to play that you'll see reflected in the, the budget request, especially around uh, areas like the, the Chrissy Grant Program, which we think can contribute to uh, fluidity, uh, both in, in uh, traditional freight rail and in some of these multimodal contexts that require uh, 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 specialized equipment and facilities that can make a big difference in, in the kinds of context that you're describing. Uh, also, I, I would point to the fact that uh, in addition to being consumers of, of, of rail, uh, agriculture uh, producers are more likely to live in communities that are impacted just by quality of life issues like blocked crossings and, uh, and the safety issues that come with a lot of uh, grade crossings. So why we're very glad there's a rail crossing elimination program included in IIJA. Uh, and have been able to use some of our other uh, programs as well to help support projects that would just reduce some of the uh, occasions for that kind of blockage to happen in the first place. All right. And a quick question. Many cities and counties in my district, and it kind of goes along with what you were just saying, um, don't have the resources. A lot of smaller communities. I've got some of these communities don't even have city councils. They're mm -hmm. just literal communities. Um, and they struggle to get the resources together, apply for some of these grants. Um, they're burdensome. There's a lot of regulations. Is there anything that you've done or that you have the ability to do to help alleviate some of these problems, allow these smaller communities to have the access to the same resources as some of the large communities that can afford to have the representation a lot of them have? Thank you. It's something we think about a lot. We're trying to make sure that our processes are simpler and more straightforward so that you don't have to be a community big enough to have a full-time federal relations person on staff to be able to successfully apply for and, and, and win in our programs. And I would point to the, uh, the, the proportions of rural projects that we've been able to fund, I think, is evidence of progress here, but I believe there's more that we can do, too. A couple areas just briefly to, to mention. One, Something as simple as reducing the page count of our notice of funding opportunities, just uh, having it uh, done with fewer words and fewer pages, uh, I think is uh, emblematic of our effort to make sure that the process is easier to navigate. We're also doing more hands-on technical assistance to help guide communities that maybe haven't been through this experience in the first place 
uh, through these processes though, so that they're less opaque, less convoluted, and so those communities are more likely to succeed. Uh, our routes council, chaired by the deputy secretary, is specifically focused on this, uh, but we're also trying to just work it into the day-to-day -day work of our various programs. All right, thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. I just want to gently remind my colleagues, try not to give the secretary a question with 10 seconds left. Uh, so we can move uh, quickly through and all members can ask their, their questions. Uh, with that, I recognize uh, my good friend, Ms. Watson Coleman from New Jersey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, good to see you, sir. And, and thank you so much for visiting our Mercer Trenton Airport. It was a pleasure hosting you, and I know that you got to see exactly what, we, what I've been talking to you about, about an airport that provide services to so many people, not only in 12th Congressional District, my district, even in the state of Pennsylvania and in other counties across the state of New Jersey. I appreciate the fact that you not only saw the uh, desperate need for a new terminal, uh, for a new fire station, a new traffic control tower uh, to accommodate the growing demand, but in, in order for the airport to achieve these goals, they will need help from the federal government in the form of grants and formula funding. Yeah, my airport is an example of the many more small and mid-sized airports across the country that are too in need of federal assistance. And I was hoping to ask what would happen to airports like the one in my district if federal funding was set back to the 2022 levels for operations, for infrastructure grants to the airports, for the airport terminal program, sir, and for the grants and aids for airports. I know that's a bit much for one question. I'll do my best to answer it all in it. one go, though, and, and appreciate the question because I think it's important to make clear that uh, uh, there would uh, be a real impact here. The, the uh, Airport Improvement Program formula funds and the allocations of the airport infrastructure grants uh, are based on the last the employment data for the last full calendar year. So if that's uh, uh, frozen in place uh, or if, if the calendar year 22 employments were abnormally low, which is true for a lot of airports, and I think may be the case for Trenton Mercer, uh, which uh, sees a lot of growth in the future but wouldn't be able to book it uh, if, if they're frozen into that prior level. Uh, the, the consequences that you'd see a reduction both in the entitlements and, and the allocations. Uh, now, there, there is a, a best of three provision in the, uh, in the statute uh, for the 22 and 23 allocations, so it tries to do uh, more of a rolling average, but uh, that would expire after fiscal year 23 as well, unless there were an extension. Uh, and so uh, uh, that that would both for, for that AIG uh, and uh, AIP programming uh, potentially have a very uh, real impact. The uh, better news, I guess, would be that the airport terminal uh, program is a competitive discretionary grant program that doesn't have that same uh, connection to the employment data, but those other sources of funding would very much potentially be impacted. Mm -hmm. And our tower program, I mean, you were able to see the site challenge that we had in our control tower. Yes, and, and uh, so many towers would be impacted by the kinds of cuts that, that are being described here. And uh, unfortunately, uh, it would often be at the smaller airports that the uh, cuts would be felt most severely. So we're really uh, happy to be in what we consider to be the post-pandemic period. And Hopefully, people get to enjoy vacations and things of that nature. And in my airport, we go to places we like to go, to go on vacation, sunny Florida being one of them. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Secretary, in February, DOT announced the first round investments for the new Reconnecting Communities pilot program, another really exciting and important program. A total of $185 million in grants were awarded to 45 projects across the country to help reconnect these communities that are cut off from opportunity and burdened by past transportation infrastructure decisions. We were able to show you, um, at least through a uh, presentation, what that Route 29 looks like in terms of cutting Trenton off from its a great resource of the water. I know that several communities in my district are, are excited to this program, including some in the 12th district, and are working to apply for future opportunities. For FY24, the request comes at $100 million, with $100 million in advance appropriations provided by the bipartisan infrastructure law. And I was hoping if you would share some of the projects that are being funded, why they are being chosen, what impact there will be, and what would happen if that funding were cut as well. 
One thing that's been striking in this first of its kind program is the level of demand. In our uh, first year, we got uh, tons of uh, applications in which reflected both construction goals and uh, planning projects to just get communities through that first stage. Uh, we uh, had a, a round of, of announcements, uh, uh, including, uh, I believe, one in the state of New Jersey, uh, one in uh, New York uh, state that I was able to visit, Buffalo, uh, where they seek to cap the Kensington Express that really uh, is, is something of a gash through a very important part of the community that community members have been hoping for decades to be able to do something about. Uh, there's another example in Florida uh, where uh, an interchange really has had a, a negative impact on the community but can be addressed and, and will be now thanks to this funding. Uh, there are places in every part of the country. It's not one region, north, south, east, west, uh, where uh, you do have these pieces of infrastructure that have served to divide rather than connect. And uh, I can tell you that uh, there is more than enough demand for all of the funding we're seeking and then some. Uh, cutting it, I think, would leave a lot of communities disappointed. Thank you very much. I yield back, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, we now go to my good friend from Virginia, Mr. Klein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here. I know you're working uh, to address the supply chain challenges that are confronting our nation following the pandemic. Uh, a lot of those as impacted by uh, aging or limited infrastructure, uh, our highways, our, inf our interstate highway system in particular uh, needs upgrading, updating. I represent the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia, uh, Virginia 6, which stretches from the Roanoke Valley up to Shenandoah Valley and has Interstate 81, which runs along it. Uh, I-81 runs from I-40 uh, down in Tennessee to the Canadian border in upstate New York, as you know. But it is the, uh, the economic backbone of Western Virginia, and it runs over 300 miles uh, in both Virginia 6 and Virginia 9 and Southwest Virginia. It, it is not just a transportation corridor for goods and services from uh, points south, Mexico, and otherwise to points north, New York, or, uh, and, and New England, but it's also a, a major corridor for uh, local farmers, for families, for small businesses. Um, it really is truly, truly the backbone of the of the valley. Um, for many years, we have all agreed on both sides of the aisle, uh, along with uh, my colleague from Northern Virginia, uh, Deli uh, Congresswoman Wexton, and, and also Senators Warner and Kane, that uh, I-81 does need a third lane. And uh, it was built originally for 15% trucking capacity, but often operates with 30, maybe upwards of 50, depending on the time of day trucking capacity uh, or percentage of trucks. Um, it's the most dangerous highway in Virginia with over 2,000 crashes and millions of hours of delays yearly. So uh, the Commonwealth has adopted a corridor improvement plan. But the timeline is challenging. And so I, I would just ask that as uh, you consider uh, resources and allocating those resources nationally to address uh, the supply chain issues, congestion issues, uh, that you look at the bottleneck that's being created by uh, I-81 in the valley only being two lanes, and hopefully there are opportunities within the department uh, to make the interstate safer and run more efficiently. Well, thank you. I'm uh, uh, aware of uh, this corridor improvement plan. I believe uh, there are 64 different projects that are, are, are encompassed within it and know that that's going to be a, a big lift. Uh, I'm aware that uh, the, the state has put forward a lot of resources and uh, we're glad that the increased formula dollars that come with the uh, infrastructure law are, uh, are part of the mix of funding available for that. Uh, but certainly would also note that there are a number of discretionary programs that we have that might also uh, come into play for uh, many of the projects that are part of that broader vision and uh, uh, certainly a, a, an area that we're very much aware of as we're doing our work. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> to also ask about the livestock industry, which is important in the Valley. Uh, the livestock industry has been exempted from uh, the ELD mandate, electronic logging devices, uh, for the last five years. Meanwhile, statistics uh, through the trucking industry as a whole show that ELDs have, in fact, reduced safety on the roads as drivers are speeding to beat the clock. Uh, how do you respond to the fact that the ELD implementation uh, may have led to less safe roadways in some areas? Well, the idea of ELDs is to make sure that drivers do not uh, drive longer than they safely can, leading to fatigue, which we know is a major cause of, uh, of crashes. Uh, certainly, if uh, there is an attempt to uh, defeat or work around that, 
uh, that could lead to an unsafe condition. Uh, I don't believe the solution is to abandon our, our work to uh, reduce fatigue. But I do believe that, that there are a number of steps that we can take that are part of a broader safe systems approach that will make a difference uh, in conjunction with the work we do around hours of service. And just one example that I would mention is uh, the availability of truck parking. We know one thing that creates a lot of pressure on drivers is as they get close to timing out on their hours of service, uh, they're not sure if there's going to be a safe, uh, let alone convenient, place to park between uh, uh, between now and then. It's one of the reasons why we are encouraging states to use eligible formula dollars to fund truck parking and using some of our own discretionary dollars, most recently in uh, projects in Florida and in Tennessee, to directly construct more truck parking because uh, that shortage is real and an issue we hear a lot about. If we have uh, any left drivers. over after that third lane gets constructed, we'll put some more parking <laughs> on there too. <laughs> Maybe they could go together. Um, one more question. Uh, tw truckers and independent owners, operators from my district have expressed concern uh, with the FMCSA's proposed rule for heavy vehicle speed limiters. Time and again, um, data suggests that it's a, it's a complicated factor about the causation of, of truck passenger accidents, uh, not to mention that the rule could be particularly harmful to small business owners. Uh, does DOT think implementing this rule will be specifically harmful to independent owner operators? And how did DOT decide on the suggested 60 mile per hour maximum? I was, well, uh, I'd asked you, Mr. Secretary, to be short. You're kind of violating sorry, the rule there, Mr. Okay. He didn't uh, didn't get a secretary at the time. Uh, uh, well, the, the short answer is uh, safety is our north star. We'll be guided by the data, and we welcome stakeholder and in industry uh, uh, input as we're uh, working toward finalization of rules. Thank you. Thank you. I recognize my good friend from California, Representative Torres, for questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Secretary. It's really great to see you. I hope the family is doing great. Um, on behalf of my constituents, I want to thank you and your staff for all of the assistance that you have provided, that they have provided um, to the Inland Empire, the district that I represent, in the short time that you have been the Secretary of Transportation. Thank you um, for the race grant. Um, you came out last September and saw the challenges that we have um, in our district. Um, you know, if we want to talk about uh, the Inland Empire, it really encompasses uh, my colleague, Pete, uh, Representative Aguilar's um, district also. I represent um, the bulk of the freight corridor. Um, we have one international airport where UPS has its lo second largest um, mm. hub. Um, we have three smaller uh, executive airports, for lack of a better word. Um, and we have three major freeways that where trucks, um, you know, compete and dominate on most days. Um, we really need your help. Um, and I know that you have given so much uh, and your staff has given so much, but um, I would like to ask of you um, here to help us um, figure out maybe there's a pilot program out there that we can work through um, where we can get technical assistance to deal um, with some of the um, issues related to the freight uh, corridor that I represent. While the Port of LA and Long Beach are extremely important, and I would like to uh, just remind you that 40% of all containerized imports come through the Port of LA and Long Beach and 30% of all exports go through those two same ports. Pretty much all of that comes through my district first, but either rail, the Alameda corridor splits my district in half, um, which causes other problems because we have no over or underpasses. I can't say no, very few uh, um, overpasses to deal with emergency vehicles that need to get from one side to the other to help people in need. So um, we have experienced the worst air pollution. Um, we continue to experience that even mm -hmm. through the COVID um, uh, period where our commuters were grounded um, working from home. Um, we still had the worst air pollution in California was centered in, in, that, in my district. We had 177 ozone days. Mm -hmm. Um, so we really need help to figure out how do we, um, we're not looking to shut down any port, we're not looking to shut down commerce, 
we are looking for assistance and some relief. You saw some of that with children um, challenging, challenging um, streets where children had to um, compete with truckers, uh, you know, to walk from one uh, from their home neighborhood to their high school or middle school. Um, so I think that you get some of um, our 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 um, challenges. I just want to ask you, with the cuts that Republicans are um, uh, right now, um, you know, trying to um, reduce our budget, this budget, the infrastructure bill. Um, communities like mine simply cannot do without your help. And a 20% reduction uh, to your team would have, you know, critical impacts in my, negative impacts in my district. Well, thanks for the question. And I, I will never forget uh, uh, during my visit to your and Representative Aguilar's uh, uh, district, uh, seeing that passageway that the students of Etiwanda High School uh, have to walk under without a sidewalk, let alone uh, or even a gutter, let alone a sidewalk, mm -hmm. on their way to school. And of course, we're proud to be supporting uh, changes to that to that corridor. The broader issue you're speaking about is one that that implicates both economic security because we need those supply chains to be strong, and justice because the people who live along those supply chains shouldn't have negative health consequences just because so many goods pass through uh, their their neighborhoods and in, in their area. Uh, this is a good example, I think, of of what it means when we talk about how we use taxpayer dollars to make our country better off. Uh, you know, programs like the Congestion Mitigation and Air Quality Improvement Formula Grant Program, we've got $2.6 billion uh, programmed for that for fiscal 24. Uh, the Carbon Reduction Program, which was created by the Infrastructure Law, which uh, reduces not just carbon, but I think uh, also other harmful pollutants often uh, will be reduced too. And strongly believe that we need to be doing more, not less right now, uh, especially because one of the challenges of our time is to accommodate and encourage uh, a higher volume uh, of throughput in, in terms of our goods yes. without that leading to a higher uh, volume of burden and pollution that, that would come with it. Um, I, I know that you have two young babies, and I hate to um, add you know, more to your travel um, agenda, um, especially since you already uh, visited our district. But um, I, I want to ask for you to send a team of your staff to work with us um, I would like to have a round table that would include the governor's office because um, they are looking to um, pass bills um, for buffer zones. So if buffer zone areas are created, um, it, it's going to kill how um, goods movement you know, flows through the region. So we need to work together. I apologize to the chair and I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, we next go to our good friend from Arizona, Mr. Sistamani. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and thank you, Secretary, for being here with us today. As uh, you know, in my home state of Arizona, Interstate 10 connects our main cities of Phoenix and Tucson, and it serves as a critical artery for many individuals who frequently travel back and forth for work, for pleasure, for tourism, it's also key for security and more. And as our state has grown exponentially, so has the need for an expansion of the I-10. This interstate serves as a major corridor for our state and our region, facilitating international trade and commerce as well. But it, it's become a dangerous portion of the highway with only two lanes in each direction and, uh, and creating a bottleneck. So every time I go home, I hear from my constituents about their growing frustrations with the worsening traffic on the highway and the dozens of accidents occurring due to a lack of proper infrastructure. A few months ago, I was disappointed when uh, this administration denied my state's mega grant application for an expansion of the I-10. And on December 16th, uh, 2021, the Federal Highway Administration, an agency within the Department of Transportation, of course, issued a policy memo encouraging states to prioritize using Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act formula funds for road and bridge repair over capacity expansion. This memo was uh, has since been uh, rescinded, prioritized the implementation of partisan policies and disregarded congressional intent. So can you please tell me about how the Department of Transportation is prioritizing infrastructure project grants and how Arizona can be more competitive moving forward? 
Well, first of all, let, let me make clear that we recognize there's no one-size-fits-all policy. While we want to make sure that uh, transportation policy and choices reflect things that America has learned over the years, including the effects of highway expansion on induced demand and the fact that sometimes it is not the solution that it seems to be. It's also certainly uh, still the case that there are places where expansion is called for and often uh, the places where that is most likely uh, to be called for are in high growth areas like what we see in Arizona and the West. And in any case, as both iterations of our federal highway guidance make clear, with regard to formula dollars, these decisions are up to the states. In terms of the application you referenced, I do want to make sure it's, it's well understood that uh, we received far more excellent applications for the mega program than we could fund. We were able to say yes to approximately 4% uh, of the funding, which meant, of course, 96% worth of the applicants uh, went away disappointed uh, because we had about $20 billion of applications for about $1 billion of funding. Uh, however, of course, that was only the first year of the program, and that's only one of many programs. And so you have my commitment that if we haven't already, uh, our team will get together with the project sponsors for that I-10 uh, application and make sure that they know everything that uh, would be useful to them in making their application uh, as strong and competitive as possible, both for future rounds of mega and potentially other programs that it might qualify for. I do have one more question, but uh, before that, I, I want to just say that looking at the fiscal year 23 uh, grants, it seems that most of the projects that you're referring to that receive the mega grants incorporate bicycle, pedestrian, or transit infrastructure. So I just want to um, want to ensure the DOT isn't letting a political agenda prevent states like mine from receiving much needed grants. So to my question, uh, according to your budget, DLT expects to pay about $70 million for rent and utilities in fiscal year 2024, in addition to expenses for maintenance and repairs of its headquarters. Given your current telework policy and the 20% office vacancy rate in D.C., I have concerns that this world-class space is not being utilized um, by 5,000 DLT headquarters staff. What is your headquarters building current capacity rate, and how does that compare to what's uh, to what it was before the pandemic? So without having the numbers off the top of my head, it is certainly the case that there are fewer people in the building any given day uh, than there were pre-pandemic. And while I would note that uh, the majority of our workers across U.S. DOT are in work environments from truck inspection facilities to air traffic control uh, uh, settings where uh, remote work is not an option for the office jobs, uh, telework has become uh, an important dimension of how they work. And while I think uh, we still have not seen the, the final version of what the new normal will be like for office work in general and for federal office work in particular. I believe it is likely that there will be substantial taxpayer savings from right-sizing our office footprint uh, to reflect some of the gains in efficiency that might come from more flexible patterns, uh, things like reservation systems for spaces. Uh, and there's a modest but meaningful uh, part of our budget request, about $6 million for things like uh, procuring a system to manage that and digitally mapping our spaces uh, so that uh, if we're not just going back to the way things were in 2019, uh, we're seeing taxpayer savings along the way for more efficient use of the space we do have. Uh, well, thank you. I, I have more on this, but I'll save it for round two. I don't want to get in trouble with uh, the chairman. I'm already sitting in the... Uh in the unique spot down here. I don't want to get into more trouble. Mr. Chair, I yield back. We can find more unique spots if we need to. But, uh, <laughs> I'm okay very, with this one. I'm happy. Very wise. Happy to, very happy wise. to be here. <laughs> with that, let me go to my friend from New York, Mr. Espiat. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, ranking member. Uh, Secretary, uh, thank you for your service, uh, your commitment to our infrastructure, to transportation, Certainly, our country needed much more than just a facelift. Uh, it needed a major investment, and the Bipartisan Infrastructure and Jobs Act provided $1.2 trillion to do just that. And last time such a big investment was made was back in 1956. I don't think you were born there, uh, but it was uh, $25 billion that the Eisenhower administration provided to increase um, from 7,000 uh, to 41,000 miles of road across the highways across the country. Uh, but this does so much more. I mean, this is really a major investment, and I think it's going to be a phenomenal uh, job producer and, and, and motivator for our economy. And I also want to thank you for uh, your 
your budget, which includes $2.9 um, billion for capital investment. And in there, there's uh, an important project, Mr. Chairman, in my district, which is a Second Avenue subway. We could build a subway still in our country, and that will address many needs in a transportation desert and will connect uh, East Harlem and Harlem to the rest of the world. Uh, my question is, um, Secretary, your budget requests $59 million for cr cr cross-cutting uh, research and development to advance new technologies and practices uh, to improve uh, railroad safety and efficiency. What are some of the new technologies in, in the works to improve railroad safety? Could you complete these necessary improvements with nearly uh, a 20% cut? I mean, if we're having these rail uh, safety issues, uh, what will the cut mean regarding that? Well, th thank you for the question. And whether we're talking about enforcement or whether we're talking about research, I believe this is the wrong time to be cutting railroad safety investments. Uh, the, the kind of work that, uh, uh, that we propose to do, I think, could make a, a, a real uh, and lasting difference in operating improvements as well as safety improvements on our rails. Some of the things that are uh, in view of the FRA's research and development program include uh, further refining autonomous track geometry systems and rail integ integrity systems. They use ultrasound to help identify uh, rail flaws that might not be visible to the naked eye. Uh, there would be standards and specifications for uh, the next generation of positive train control systems. We're hearing a lot about uh, uh, development on the surface uh, road side, but also uh, intelligent rail systems that could make grade crossing safer, or prevent uh, trespass. Uh, are uh, something that, that, that we could do a lot of good work on. Uh, anything and everything that could be used to prevent a crash, a derailment, an accident is something that we want to make sure we're investing these R&D uh, dollars to help with, and we would like to see more, not less, go toward that, especially at this time when the country's uh, eyes have been opened to the frequency of uh, derailments and other rail accidents in this country. Thank you. I think that's uh, critically important, and I hope that we can avert that crisis. Finally, I'm going to make a statement. Uh, I always tell my colleagues that I have the uh, largest parking lot in the entire country. It's called the Cross Bronx Expressway. And gridlock there often, every day, turns it into a parking lot. And, uh, and so we're working to cap it, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Secretary. Uh, I'm working with Congressman Richie Torres for that. Uh, Robert Moses, uh, the infamous Robert Moses, mm -hmm. so like divided the Bronx into the South Bronx and North Bronx with the um, Cross Bronx Expressway. But that's a little stretch and not many people know about that connect, connect the Cross Bronx Expressway to the George Washington Bridge, and mm -hmm. that's called the Trans-Manhattan Expressway. Mm -hmm. I would like perhaps to that be considered also. It's a very small, uh, less than a mile perhaps, but stretch, but uh, important as well. And I would like to that for that to be considered in the studies and mm -hmm. and the work in capping that infamous uh, parking lot that I have in my district there, Cross Bronx Expressway. We'd Thank welcome you. a chance to work with you on that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, just as a uh, housekeeping matter, I want to advise the members to make sure everybody gets a first question. So we have two more members to go but we will bring the hearing to a close just for time consideration out of respect for the secretary. I know a lot of us have travel needs as well. So uh, only two more questions and then, then uh, final statements by the ranking member and myself. With that, I recognize my very good friend uh, from Arkansas, Mr. Womack, for questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, prayers for uh, uh, the Cole, Oklahoma region, uh, devastated by a tornado last night. Um, Mr. Secretary, I too want to kind of put my name on the same question that came up earlier about the discretionary grant applications and the tremendous cost. Small communities that just don't have the resources that bigger communities have. Um, just in no response necessary, but just hear it from us. We we have the same concerns. It was voiced earlier. Uh, as much as one hundred and seventy thousand dollars, or hundreds of man hours engaged in outside consulting firms to be able to uh, to demonstrate qualification for these projects. And uh, we, we want the department to be aware of that. Um, I have an FTA, uh, Federal Transit Administration, uh, issue requesting the ability to use urbanized area formula 
and additional fixed highway trust funds for large transit agency operating expense shortfalls. Um, essentially, requesting the ability to use federal funds to cover ridership shortfalls. And we know that, that this happened during the pandemic, uh, but now coming out of the pandemic, uh, we need to get away from, from, from the pandemic mindset, as, as I call it. Uh, even as the president acknowledges that the public health emergency is over, uh, according to the American Public Transportation Association, subway and commuter rail ridership was 62% of pre-pandemic levels in quarter four of 2022. And, and I don't think anybody with a straight face can project that ridership is going to reach pre-pandemic levels. Uh, but, and don't take it from me, but on no, in November of last year, heads of 15 of the largest transit agencies sent a letter uh, to you acknowledging that ridership would not return to pre-pandemic levels. So this begs the question, will this temporary assistance become another federal entitlement? Congress didn't intend urbanized area formula funds to be used for operating expenses. It was not an oversight. It's recognition that a transit agency should rely on ridership to fund their operations, which I personally think is a reasonable requirement. Uh, frankly, many of my constituents in Arkansas think that way too much money goes uh, to the uh, to the big trans big city transit agencies, and this proposal would only increase that amount. So, Mr. Secretary, if Congress granted you this authority, how would you ensure that this is a temporary program? We do want to make sure that uh, cities and states recognize that uh, we still expect them to make uh, appropriate investments in transit. But we also know that, that, that transit yields uh, uh, major economic benefits. For every dollar invested in transit, there's about $5 of economic growth that come with it. And uh, many transit agencies have uh, uh, continued to face uh, fiscal issues, which we think are acute uh, and we believe are uh, not permanent but are not resolving just in a year or two uh, as uh, post-COVID commuting patterns uh, continue to, to evolve in the country. The main thing I'd uh, emphasize here is that this is a form of flexibility, not a requirement from us. So we're trying to make sure that the transit agencies have what they need to uh, head off any kind of fiscal cliff that could leave uh, commuters high and dry, and at the same time uh, are not viewing this as, a, uh, uh, as uh, anything short of a measure to help bridge through that period. And, uh, of course, with this or anything else we do are uh, uh, going to make sure we're uh, staying within the, the lines of the law as written. Okay. Uh, last question is about the contract tower program. I have four airports in my district that, uh, that use this very successful public-private partnership, and I believe it enhances aviation safety. I think it's well documented. It's effective. It's cost-effective. Uh, contract towers handle about 29%. Of all U.S. tower operations, but about 10% of the overall budget. So I, I think it's a pretty good bang for the buck. <clears throat> I'm concerned about how the changes proposed in the FAA's recent market survey announcement for the contract tower program will affect aviation safety and program costs. I'm, I'm, I'm worried that we're introducing unnecessary risk into this successful program at a time when we're seeing historic air traffic control staffing shortages. So, Mr. Secretary, can you, in the remaining time, 40 seconds we have, can you help me understand how you will evaluate the risk of fundamentally changing the contract tower program uh, versus any projected cost savings? Well, uh, to be clear, uh, uh, we are uh, calling for a budget request that will uh, fully fund all towers participating in the program, uh, $194 million, uh, in addition to putting to use the $20 million provided for airport-owned federal contract towers to uh, uh, be able to uh, uh, make improvements or, or, or changes that, that need to happen uh, there. Uh, these are uh, subject to benefit cost calculations. We also recognize the uh, unique situations and distortions that have occurred across the aviation sector in recent years. And uh, uh, anything that we seek to do moving forward will be in the spirit of, of refining and improving the program, uh, but in a way that we want to make sure works for the airports and the communities concerned. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your service to our country. And um, as a former mayor, uh, you, you get a lot of these um, issues that we're Indeed. broaching with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you. We'll go to our last question of the day. My good friend, the gentlelady from uh, Virginia, Ms. Wexton. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And, and I, I was speaking to the fact that I am the last question of the day, so I'll try to move it along as best I can. Also, I want to tell you, I kind of like having my own little table down here. It's nice to be all alone down here and just have a little room to spread out. It's very nice, so I don't mind. Um, and Mr. Secretary, it's great to see you again as well. And for the first time since I've joined the subcommittee, I'm very pleased that I'm not going to be inviting you to the grand opening of the Silver Line Phase 2. 
It opened in November. We were very delighted to have you there. Thank you so much for coming. It would have been really embarrassing if I invited you twice and you hadn't shown up. So thank you. Um, it was a pleasure to be there. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I would like, to, uh, Mr. Secretary, I'd like to ask you a little bit about the Leesburg Airport. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that or not. The Leesburg Airport was one of a few, very few airports that participated in the remote tower program, but it was actually a remote tower that was operated. Um, it was entirely, entirely remote, so it was not, there was no tower there at the, at the airport. Um, and as you, as you know, the, earlier this year, the decision to start, was made to stop pursuing qualification for the remote tower technology that they had been used at the Leesburg Airport for several years. I also won't be surprised to hear that because Leesburg was untowered before it got the remote tower, it did pick up an awful lot of, of traffic during that period of time, and it was really good for the airport and also for the very region. So it's very, very concerned about what will happen if, if we stop the entire, if it suddenly becomes untowered without any other, other solution. I appreciate, appreciate FAA's, and understand that Leesburg and FAA are having, having productive talks about the uh, path forward, and, and we don't have the safety risks that would come from, um, from making it stop altogether. So I appreciate they're working together come up with a contract power tower program in 2020, construction of a physical tower. Um, I look forward to discussing with this more detail with Administrator Nolan next week. I want to know now, I want to ask you now, can we, can we count on the commitment of the D, D, D Department to assure us of the continuity of air traffic control services beyond FY23 at Leesburg Executive Airport as it transitions from a remote tower to a more permanent solution? Well, thank you. I know that FAA has been uh, closely coordinating with the city and the airport uh, uh, when it comes to the importance of making sure that safe operations continue. Uh, as you noted, uh, and, and my understanding is the same, uh, uh, that there is a, a plan to build a brick and mortar physical tower uh, and uh, Leesburg has been accepted into the federal contract tower program. Uh, my understanding is there's a discussion right now about how it might be possible to use a mobile tower as an interim solution uh, to maintain those separation services. Uh, and uh, you have my commitment that we'll continue to be in good dialogue and work with the city and the airport uh, to find solutions that are going to maintain safety and, and support operations there. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. Glad to hear that. And it's, it's still going to be nicer than the tower at Manassas Airport. But we'll talk about that next time for us. Um, Union Station, I would like to talk to you a little bit about that. As you know, we're doing, we're doing a lot of real exp expansion work in Virginia. One of the key, several key projects which will unlock the rail, rail network is the Union Station Expansion Project. It's over a century old and unfortunately desperately needs safety, security, and accessibility improvements. Union Station is right here. It's very close to the Capitol. It serves a lot of the folks here in the, in the area. A lot of the folks take the metro station there to come into work every day. Concerned by the slow pace of progress made by DOT and FRA, on the implementation of the project. It's been nearly a decade since the environmental review of this project began. Over two years since FRA reduced, released the environmental impact statement. Union Station is the only station in the country owned by DOT. You know that, right? I believe so, yes. Yeah, and it's a beautiful station. It needs some facelift. Federal government has the responsibility to ensure that the Union Station is maintained and is expanded to meet the needs of the public. Do you agree that the completion of this project is of significant importance to, the, to both the regional and national interests? Uh, Union Station is certainly a very important facility, both for commuters and for intracity travel. And uh, uh, we want to, we're, we're pleased to see that there is uh, uh, effective leadership uh, with the uh, uh, newly organized uh, Union Station Development Corporation. Uh, and and uh, certainly agree the that their success is important. Can you tell us what steps the department is taking to ensure that, that, that the record of decision will be, will be completed within the, final, within the calendar year? Uh, I'd have to check on the latest status of the uh, environmental process, but certainly something that we're watching closely. I visited the site uh, last year, and our deputy secretary was there recently. Uh, I think that in addition to the environmental uh, uh, process, it'll, of course, be necessary to identify uh, appropriate uh, sources for funds, and we've been in touch with the mayor and, and others about uh, uh, the visions for how to do that. Very good. Hopefully that record of decision will be, will be completed by the end of the year. That I would have to get back to you on. Very good. And so you want to talk a little bit about the use of Merchant Marine Academy. I've had the pleasure of, of recommending four of, of nominating five, five students there. And it's a, great, it's a great school. It's one of the research, one of the service academies that is kind of the little best kept, best kept secret among them. People can get out of the Merchant Marine Academy. They can join the Navy. They can join the Merchant Marine. They can do basically, they can write their own ticket. Um, but it's made me very sad to see that, that, the, uh, that the individuals from the 10th District who are attending there sent us pictures of what the facilities there are look like the conditions are well beyond what anybody would expect from an institution, let alone one of our nation's top five service academies. I'm concerned that these conditions would hinder our ability to attract a diverse pool of young men and women needed for our American military sea lift. 
Um, and it's, it's terrible conditions. I think. Have you ever visited the Merchant Marine Academy? You had an opportunity to visit there? Yes, twice. And did you concur that it needs some, some love from TLC? Yeah, I'd like you, uh, I, I share the view that it's uh, uh, one of the uh, um, underappreciated gems of, uh, uh, of uh, our transportation system. Uh, and yes, uh, and, and I'll emphasize that our uh, budget request includes uh, a robust request for physical capital improvements because they're very much needed for student quality of life uh, and for the uh, durability of the facilities there. Are you sure that this work will be overseen by a question? We're out of time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. I'll have a question off the Thank you very much. I now go to my very good friend, uh, the ranking member, Mr. Quigley, for any closing remarks he cares to make. Mr. Chairman, thank you for uh, handling a complicated hearing during votes and uh, getting everybody home on time. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, uh, earlier you were referencing Dickens that this is indeed for transportation the best of times and the worst of times. Clearly, the problems and challenges are extraordinary but the opportunities are great. Uh, the infrastructure bill is just part of that, but it is up to us to uh, continue to move forward because those opportunities are essential to compete on a worldwide market and to keep our people safe. So uh, uh, thank you for taking on this job. As I referenced when you took it, uh, to the spoils go the victor, but we're glad you're doing it. Thank you. Thanks very much. I thank my friend, Mr. Secretary. I uh, want to join the ranking member. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for your testimony, which, as usual, was full and forthcoming and direct and uh, very much appreciated. To my friends uh, on the other side of the aisle who were concerned about cuts, I'm going to echo a quote that I used uh, uh, in our last secretarial meeting. Uh, we don't have our final number yet, so it may be better than you think. Uh, it may be just as bad as you think, or it could be worse than you think. Uh, the one thing I will guarantee you, you won't be happy with it, whatever it is. So uh, that's fair enough. But I also take the opportunity to remind my friends, uh, we're in an extraordinary inflationary cycle, the worst in over 40 years. Most economists agree that was kicked off by the American Rescue Plan. Uh, I would argue that the, uh, the uh, Inflation uh, Reduction Act was probably the most misnamed piece of legislation in history because it was basically a climate change bill. You can be for it or against it, but it didn't help with inflation. It accelerated that problem. And we're dealing with that now, uh, you know, partly by restraining spending, but the Federal Reserve obviously is raising interest rates, which I know complicates your life, Mr. Secretary, but much more important to all of us. It complicates the life of every single American. Nothing tougher on families uh, than inflation. And the lower your income, the worse problem it is for you. So that's the consequence, we think, of overspending. And we're going to do some things about that. But you also have my commitment. We're going to work with you, particularly in the safety areas. Uh, we share your concerns and appreciate your efforts in that regard. Uh, I don't know any politicians, uh, Republican or Democrat, that don't like to build roads and don't think infrastructure is a worthy investment. Uh, so we're going to do as much as we can within the confines of the number we're finally given to work with you and your department, certainly to work with my friends on both sides of the aisle, all of whom have legitimate local concerns and all of whom care very deeply about uh, the national transportation infrastructure and what we can do to, to make it better. So again, uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you for your service. Thank you for being here. I look forward to working with you in the weeks and months ahead. And with that, the hearing's adjourned.